It's a new world. Carter's foreign policy. In his first speech on foreign policy, President Jimmy Carter proclaimed that it's a new world and that he would direct the nation away from the clandestine dealings of Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon. Carter announced that he would deal with nations in a fair and humane way and would put the defense of basic human rights first. This is different from Nixon. Carter's foreign policy would be based on this defense of human rights. Carter demonstrated this by first cutting off federal aid to the nations of Chile and Argentina for human rights violations. His other successes in Latin America involved the Panama Canal, if you can call them, if you can call the success. Carter secured treaties that granted the nation of Panama with more authority over the waterway, which culminated in a full transfer of the waterway to Panama in the year 2000. To the voters, Carter explained that American ownership of the Panama Canal fueled anti-Yankee sentiment throughout Latin America. Carter also convinced the Senate that the canal was no longer the economic and strategic necessity that it once had been, and the Senate approved the treaty. When leading conservative Ronald Reagan claimed that the Panama Canal was sovereign American soil purchased fair and square in Theodore Roosevelt's administration, one senator quipped, yeah, we stole it fair and square, so why can't we keep it? Now, Carter did not have as much success, though, in the neighboring nation of Nicaragua. The Sandinista movement toppled the repressive regime of Antazio Somoza, whom the Americans had supported. Originally a coalition of moderates and Democrats and communists, the Sandinistas then tilted toward militant Marxism. Carter opposed this turn, but realized he could do little to change it. Republicans then charged that Carter's policies in Central America had given a green light to communism, and then pledged to remove Nicaragua's Sandinista-controlled government. And in 1989, that's exactly what the Republicans did. Carter did have success, though, in the Middle East, by bringing Israel and Egypt together to the negotiating table in the Camp David Accords. At Carter's invitation, President Anwar Sadat of Egypt and Prime Minister Mehikan Begin of Israel came to Camp David to seek a peace treaty between the two nations, whom had been in a state of war since 1973. Within two weeks of negotiations, Israel promised to withdraw its troops from the Sinai Peninsula. In return, Egypt agreed to recognize Israel as a sovereign nation, thus becoming the first Arab nation to do so. For the United States, this has been an uninterrupted supply of Arab oil. The President Sadat admitted assassination. The significance of the Camp David Accords is that it kept high-level discussions open between the two nations. It lowered the level of bitterness between the two nations, and it bound both nations to the United States through Carter's promises of economic aid. In Asia and Africa, the Carter administration emphasized accommodation or the expansion of economic and cultural relations with those two continents. For example, Carter supported the transition of Zimbabwe from a white colonial regime to a government run by a black majority. Carter also negotiated a new SALT treaty with the Soviet Union. SALT means Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. This is SALT II. It was supposed to set limits for bombers, missiles, warheads, and new weapon systems. But then Carter pulled SALT II off the table when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in December 1979. Why did the Soviets invade Afghanistan? Good question. They feared the growing influence of Islamic fundamentalists along its borders. Carter's opponents, though, saw this invasion as evidence that the United States had finally gone soft on communism and was again failing to contain it. After all, the United States had rejected the containment policy in 1972 when Nixon introduced detente. These critics claimed that Carter suffered from a post-Vietnam syndrome because he responded to world crises in non-military ways. What Carter do in this case? He pulled SALT II off the table, he halted grain exports to the Soviet Union, and last but not least, 
he organized a boycott of the 1980 Summer Olympic Games in Moscow. And by the way, the Soviet Union returned the favor in 1984 when they boycotted the Summer Olympic Games in Los Angeles. But Carter had other problems as well than just the Soviets. On November 4th, 1979, about 400 armed Muslim militants broke into the American embassy compound in Tehran, Iran, and took everyone captive. The reason for this had deep roots. During World War II, the Allies deposed the Shah of Iran, where he was pro-Nazi, and replaced him with his son, Muhammad Reza Pavlevi. By the early 1950s, Iran was dominated by Mohammad Mossadegh, a leftist who had sought to finance social reform by Anglo nationalizing the Anglo-Iranian oil company. In 1953, an Iranian army, backed by the CIA, arrested Mossadegh and restored Pavlevi to the role of Shah. This ensured a steady flow of cheap oil to the United States and large amounts of weapons to Iran. Over time, Iran became the most powerful military force in the Middle East. And although Iran was a member of OPEC, it remained a friend of the United States. In fact, Carter once called Iran a st island of stability in the Middle East. But behind the scenes, things were completely different. The Shah's secret police brutally suppressed liberal opponents. Muslim religious leaders opposed Pavlevi's attempts to introduce Western ideas and technology into Iran. And because of his close relationship to the United States, the Shah's opponents hated the United States almost as much as they hated Pavlevi. Riots and demonstrations compulsed through Iran throughout 1977. Then in 1978, it seemed that the whole nation of Iran rose up against the Shah. In January 1979, Pavlevi was forced to flee the country. A revolutionary government headed by the Ayatollah Ruhola Khomeini, who was a religious leader, he assumed the power. Khomeini called the United States the Great Satan and seized the American embassy when Carter allowed Pavlevi to enter the United States for cancer treatment. The Shah was dying. The militants then announced, once they took over the embassy, that the Americans in the embassy would be held hostage until the United States returned the Shah to Iran for trial as a traitor. They also demanded that Pavlevi's wealth be confiscated and surrendered to the Iranian government. Carter rejected these demands and instead employed non-militant means. He froze Iranian assets in the United States and banned trade with Iran until the hostages were freed. A stalemate developed as neither side refused to budge even after the Shah had left the United States for Panama. In the United States, a remarkable emotional response was produced by the crisis. For the first time since Vietnam, the nation agreed on something. These hostages must be freed. In April 1980, Carter changed his tactics in the Iranian, in the Iranian hostage crisis. He went militant. He ordered a team of Marine command, commandos flown into Iran and sea stallion helicopters in a desperate attempt to flee the hostages. This is Operation Eagle Claw. Several helicopters broke down when their rotors sucked sand into the engines. Call, Carter called off the attempt. In a nighttime retreat, confusion between helicopters resulted in a crash, and eight commandos were killed. The Iranians took joy at what just might be the lowest moment in American military history by showing off the wrecked aircraft and captured American equipment. The stalemate continued, and when the Shah died in Egypt in July 1980, the Iranians made no attempt to release the hostages. And by the fall of 1980, Carter seemed hopeless as to how to solve this crisis. Thank you.